everybody. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning, our island and council, Mr. Gibbon and staff, public. Welcome to our meeting today. I call the meeting to order at 9.30. The municipality of Jasper respectfully acknowledges that Jasper National Park and the municipality of Jasper are Treaty 6 and 8 territories, as well as Métis Region 4. This land is traditional territory, meeting ground, gathering place, traveling route, and home for the Dene and Métis. Miyaha, Anusha, Sukaha, Sony Nkoga, Now a call for any additions to today's agenda. Councillor Hall. I just have a change. I don't know how important it is, but it has my name as the deputy mayor and chair. That should be sure. <laughs> well, that have to be noted. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, Councillor Hall, for stepping in for me and Mayor <laughs> Ireland for stepping in for my meetings over the last two weeks. If no other additions to the agenda, I call for approval of the agenda. Councillor Melnick, all in favour? Carried. The minutes of March 8th were circulated. Is there any errors or omissions to those minutes? If not, I just noticed one thing when I was reading them last night. Um, Mayor Ireland uh, left the room um, for both presentations. Two motions were made, and it said six councillors uh, approved, but unfortunately, I was away, so it should be five. <coughs> Can I call for somebody to approve those minutes? Councillor Hall, all in favor? Thank you. Any business arising for those minutes? Sorry, my mind. It's fine. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Kelder. Just on um, the letter that was to be, is to be sent regarding grants in place of taxes. I note that the minutes reflect that council consider writing a letter to the Minister of Municipal Affairs. And thinking back, the letter that I've crafted is to the Minister of Finance. Um, with with the permission of Council, I'll just send it on. I think it was a finance thing, and, and I'm not sure whether it was just misarticulated or misrecorded, but just for certainty, um, the Minister of Municipal Affairs will be copied with that letter that will be directed to finance, which I think instituted the reduction in payments of grants in place of taxes. And, that will be the, the direct recipient of that letter with copies, as I said, to the Minister of Municipal Affairs, but also to the Premier and to our own NL. Uh, Ms. Madame. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Kelleher and the um, we did note that difference in the minutes and what was said at the meeting is, is what is included in those minutes. And I believe it was at the following council meeting that uh, Mayor Ireland indicated that we would write a letter. So it's just a, a record of what happened, but things changed after that. Thank you, Mr. Long. Anything else arising from the minutes? Any further business? If not, we move on to new business, sidewalk seating, and I'll pass it over to Mr. Gibbon. Thanks very much, uh, Deputy Mayor Kellerampi. Um, so administration is here uh, with a recommendation for council uh, with respect to sidewalk seating for the 2022 season and beyond. Um, on February 8th, uh, community will provide some direction to administration on how to administer sidewalk seating for 2022, uh, including a number of uh, a number of points specifically uh, with the intention of providing certainty for businesses uh, and enabling uh, applications that are consistent with parks architectural design of teeth, thinking multi-year approvals, um, that there was some way of accommodating legacy 
installations to provide some ability for businesses to transition from our past couple of pilot uh, years. Um, that administration identified ways to uh, simplify the renewal process for existing applications. Um, and that the administration identify an opportunity for an avenue of appeal for applicants whose submissions are judged not to be consistent. Um, and also, council provided some direction on uh, the fee that should be charged for uh, for for the use of that public space. Uh, so, administration has worked with Parks Canada and uh, internally amongst administration to come back to committee with some recommendations. And I just at this point, want to highlight uh, obviously local business stakeholders are an important voice in this, uh, as is the Jasper Park Chamber of Commerce. Uh, it is a bit challenging, of course, to coordinate that many different stakeholders in a timely manner. And administration's priority of bringing this forward today is really to ensure that it's to the public agenda through the council process so that there is some certainty for businesses. Uh, as you'll see, uh, we're providing a recommendation that provides for uh, some transition. Um, for businesses that had installations in the last couple of years, uh, but also provides a longer time frame of approval for businesses that wish to continue uh, into the future. So we think that we've struck both those. We appreciate that there may still be a lot of discussion up in the community about exactly what this should look like. Um, but really our priority in bringing this forward was to establish certainty for the 2022 season so that people could see that uh, because we know that businesses need to be able to uh, make their plans for the year, especially if they're going to be uh, renovating or changing it in the past. But I think as you'll see, uh, the administrative recommendation here uh, provides that flexibility. Uh, so our recommendation is that committee direct administration will apply for a discretionary use permit for sidewalk seating, including uh, the parameters as described in attachment A. And we do have some alternatives for our committee to consider. Uh, the, of course, committee could vary the, uh, the parameters that the administration is proposing. Uh, and the committee could direct the administration open the sidewalk city program for applications without submitting a discretionary use permit application to parks uh, to that process. I'll maybe turn it over to Ms. Nanon to speak to the conditions that are attached uh, to the program. And uh, between she and I, we can uh, discuss the process uh, considerations and recommendations that the administration made. So, proceed for you. Thank you, Mr. Gibbon. Um, as outlined in the recommendation, uh, what administration is bringing forward would be that uh, administration applied for a discretionary use permit with Parks Canada for sidewalk seating. So our permit would cover all the installations that would be installed uh, up to 2024. And the conditions are attached to the report, which uh, the proposed conditions currently are that installations will only be permitted from May 15th to October 20th, which does match the season where patio seating is possible in, in on jasper streets and also for our operations department to be able to do road maintenance and sweep parking lanes and um, not end up in a situation where we have snow on the roads still around may 1st for example um, installations shall only be located on the sidewalk with pedestrian sidewalk extensions located in the parking lane so that is the boardwalk concept where the traffic from the sidewalk would be rerouted in the parking lane um, and then item three is uh, regarding, I think, what we would, could qualify as the architectural motif, so that uh, all structures must be wooden and there are some minimum and maximum heights for different items. Tents and signage, including logos, not being permitted. So again, that is a motif item that is driven um, by how the community should look from a land use planning and development perspective. Jersey barriers will not be permitted. Patio umbrellas without logos permitted on site and must be neutral in color with uh, a few examples of the colors that would be acceptable. And importantly, uh, item seven is for the 2022 season that non-conforming installations that were previously approved in, 21, in 2021 be accepted. And uh, so that would allow businesses to continue running patios the way that they have in 2020 and 2021, arguably, and with the exception of tents not being uh, possible to install, and umbrellas and jersey barrier confirming with the motif. So not displaying any advertising, logos, or any non-conforming colors. So we're hoping that this clause would allow businesses to essentially do a few tweaks from what they did in 2021, but still continue to have that set up for 2022. And anyone who wishes to comply with the other conditions would, could receive approval for up to 2024. 
everyone else would be a one-year approval only. So those are the conditions that Mr. Gibbon and Parks Canada staff work with together and that we feel are, have, a, have a good chance of being accepted by Parks Canada if we are to go with the process and the recommendation we are putting forth is, is supported by council. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Gibbon. Okay, thanks very much, Christine. Uh, so Deputy Mayor, Keller MP, um, may be able to speak through what administration is recommending as a process here. Um, Christine's back to right. We've worked through those conditions with uh, Parks Canada to identify what is likely to be supported through their uh, permitting and approvals process. Um, and so you'll see a little bit of a flow chart um, contained in the report. Uh, essentially, administration is proposing that it start at the, at the top of that, uh, that the municipality of Jasper would apply for community wide discretionary use permit with parks um, that would essentially contain those conditions uh, that are uh, listed in the attachment. Um, that would be reviewed by parks and or PDAC, and they would approve or deny that application uh, based on that, what we believe would be approval because, uh, and we sort of pre clear this uh, to a certain extent, parks, uh, the MOJ would be able to open up applications um, and uh, the administrative decision making process, you know, if an application comes in from a business, we'd be able to look and say, is it fully consistent with the approved development permit? Um, that parks is sort of sanctioned, if it is, then they are, that application can be approved for a term up to October 31st of 2024. So that provides that long-term certainty for businesses. Um, and we're able to provide that because we know that it's consistent with something that parks has approved. Um, if an application comes in that is not consistent with those sort of long-term, that long-term approach, um, the applicant has the ability to appeal our administrative judgment on that. Um, and the appeal body would be municipal council. Uh, so somebody comes and says, well, no, I think that this, my submission should be qualified for the long-term approval, um, and here's why. Uh, administration would bring forward uh, that application to council at a committee of the whole meeting. Uh, council would then hear administration's view of why it is not consistent with what we had approved by parks. They would be able to hear from the applicant about what the applicant feels that it should be allowed, and then council would be able to make a judgment on that. Should council feel that uh, they wanted to support something that was materially different from what had been approved by parks, then council would give direction to administration to apply for an amendment to our development permit with parks, uh, which would have taken forward through the regular process. So there is an avenue of appeal, so it doesn't mean that somebody comes forward to we're intentionally setting up a structure that enables recourse for somebody. Uh, uh, directly to their elected officials and council. If somebody says administration, municipal administration has judged that my thing doesn't fit, uh, and I think that that's unfair, we say no problem, we're not here to send you your way. Council can be the judge of whether that was fair or not or appropriate or not. And if council judges that it should be approved um, for the longer term, then uh, administration may have some work to do with amending our approved development plan from parks. So it does allow for <coughs> Uh, that appeal process that fits within Jasper's unique legislative context with our sort of, you know, uh, cross jurisdictional issues. Um, if the applicant didn't wish to appeal the administration's decision and said, well, fine, I'll just do what I did last year for the upcoming season, then we could approve them for the 2022 season. So there are, there's that off record. If somebody's seeking long term certainty and they think that their thing should fit, they can appeal that to council. Then they say, well, that's fine. I'll just do what I'm doing for, for next year. I'm sorry, for this year. Um, then they can just choose to do that with that short term approval. So I hope that, that I hope that I'm muddy the waters there. I hope that the flow chart helps explain it a bit. Um, but the administration was seeking to get this to the council table so that uh, we would be able to provide some sort of hit direction from council on which approach you'd like to take uh, so that we can in turn provide some certainty out into the community for business owners. Thank you, Mr. Council. Question? Seeing as I was missing, um, I have a question. So, my understanding of reading everything and from watching that this coming summer, if um, you don't have frontage on the front of your restaurant, you can set up in the street as before. But going forward down the road, then that's not allowed anymore. Am I correct? 
Yes, that'd be Mayor Keller, MP. That's that's exactly what the administration is proposing. Um, the well, sorry, let, let me clarify. The recommendation here is does provide that exemption. So for the 2022 mm -hmm. season only, uh, if somebody wished to say we'll continue as they did in 2021, that's possible with that exclusion of pants umbrellas advertising colors. Um, going forward, if someone's seeking a longer term approval, if they wish to locate uh, on the sidewalk adjacent to other businesses, they would need approval of those businesses to go forward. So uh, that would require some discussion, potentially negotiation, or some discussion certainly between adjacent businesses, uh, because some businesses may not wish to have the frontage blocked. Other businesses, as we've actually heard uh, over the course of last year, may find there's a benefit have you know uh, patrons sitting directly there looking at the instrument goes in there and we'll the food. Um, but that would be up to the business owners to negotiate. The administration is not, uh, as you can see in the conditions, mm -hmm. does not prevent anybody from locating <coughs> anywhere on the sidewalk, but they would need that approval. And our municipal permitting process uh, has a requirement that they have approval from their adjacent businesses. Thank you, Stu. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Governor MP. I, I just want to understand points five and seven in the attachment. You said that in this discussion, if businesses chose to use the same setup that they had last year and be in the parking lot. And they had jersey barriers on that parking lot. The conditions indicate you can be in the parking lane, but you can't use jersey barriers. Uh, how does a business address that? Go ahead, Mr. Yeah, thanks very much, Deputy Mayor Kelly uh, So, so to be clear, points um, two to six in the conditions. The best way to think about those would be if you want to have, as a business, if you want to have certainty for your installation, like for 2024, you must meet points two to six. Right? Like if something meets two to six, you're good to go. We can easily we can approve you until 2024. If you want to do something different, including Jersey barriers, seating in the parking lane, or thing, then you would sort of you exercise, we can exercise the single year approval that's provided for at number seven. So basically number seven is kind of your continue with what you've been doing, but you only get approval for one year. So in your example, it comes from somebody who had previously had seating in the parking lane uh, surrounded by Jersey beers, you could say, I would like to do that again in 2020. You could say, okay, that's allowed for under condition number seven. Um, but you're only getting approval for one. <clears throat> I'm curious. Um, so, was this came down from Parks Canada as one of the conditions that we can no longer allow the seating on the street? Thanks very much, Mayor uh, Keller. So, this is this. There's some discussion back and forth between Parks and Municipal Administration. Uh, there are a variety of views about where uh, the ideal place is. Um, I think there's a desire to have a consistent approach across the municipality considering um, different assessments of risk, um, both from uh, moving vehicles um, and uh, the potential risk of uh, the general public passing through food service corridors. So I think within our municipal administration, there's a bit of a view that the, uh, the least amount of risk is to have uh, either very large physical separations like Jersey barriers, if people are located in parking lanes, or even better, have people not located so close to moving vehicles. And so that's where the preference to have the location on the sidewalks arises from. Uh, additionally, my understanding is that uh, public health services, local staff uh, either have uh, an opinion or a condition that suggests that uh, their preference is that food service staff shouldn't be sort of having that much crossing with general public that are not actually sitting in food service. So their preference is that the exit, you know, that is more adjacent to the business, which again, is on the side. 
So it, it is a bit of an internal struggle to be, to be really frank with you. They're both you know, sort of different assessments of risk and, and what we should be uh, concerned about. Um, I think there's general agreement that the smallest amount of risk comes when the installation took place on the sidewalk and the pedestrians walk around. <coughs> Just I've been on the stakes for two weeks, and um, I was quite surprised when I was in Palm Springs of how many restaurants were actually in the parking lot. And it's such a senior society, and people walk their dogs, people walk their bikes, families with strollers, and it worked flawlessly. It, it was amazing to watch. And I mean, oh, it can work. Like, I, I was truly amazed <coughs> that. Um, how well I saw it in another community working that I'm so surprised that we're taking it all up. Well, and, and Deputy Mayor Feller, to be clear, this is administration's uh, recommendation, which you know, I think is administration's mm -hmm. responsibility is to be um, you know, to try to eliminate as much risk as possible. Um, we you know, want to point out that in the report, there is the opportunity for community to vary into these conditions. Um, and uh, and then we can take forward those uh, to uh, parks to be approved process that we're recommending here. Um, but that's that's with intention. You know, it is council's process, and we're the representative of the community and you know, businesses saying what do you think would work for Jasper. Um, and so, if council wishes or community wishes to vary the conditions, uh, you can just simply do so by motion. Thank you. Questions? Councilor Hall. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Keller. Um, I have a couple questions. Who determines motif? Is it a is it within our local parks, or is it federally? So, uh, if we and Mayor Keller are for Councillor Hall, um, I know there are other people that know a lot more about the parks motif than me. My understanding is that the parks motif is a set of guidelines rather than necessarily a, a requirement that indicates what should happen rather than what is required to happen. Um, and it is broadly applied by the parks to ensure that there is a generally a consistent approach to the, to the overall visual aesthetic of the community. Um, I'm not certain that it has a legislative standing, um, and I believe that it is from the 60s. The original document that is sort of still floating around is from the 60s. I think that there is a quote-unquote interim land use policy that may supersede it, but it's not actually been federally adopted. And so the existing legislation is quite dated. The motif is, I think, explicitly a guideline uh, and not enshrined in the laws. So, I don't know, Mayor Iron probably knows more about it than me, uh, but I, and if I portray that inaccurately, I would like to be uh, fair enough, just to make sure that I didn't uh, mislead the case. Mayor Ireland? Thank you, Deputy Mayor Calgrampia. I will comment that just to get a bit of factual information on the table, and again, my facts might be subject to review as well. Um, and I say this, I, I, I hesitate to engage yet because I don't want to debate with um, administration over what is before us. I do have some other questions. And this might become a matter of debate on council. However, the uh, the regulations which govern our 1968 regulations, the, the most recent iteration of architectural motif guidelines is 1997, I believe. Um, and I think I made this point um, a few weeks ago, February 8th, probably. I, I struggle to understand how architectural motif guidelines can be applied at all to use. Um, nobody is applying for a development permit. Um, architectural motif guidelines may have their place in our community or in any community, but how in the world does that document apply to the use of space? If it does, then perhaps nobody can have a red umbrella in the backyard. It, to me, it is, it is an inappropriate use of, of a document that was never designed for this purpose. It was designed for, in my view, um, development applications, not for use of sidewalks or, or uh, 
parking facilities. I, I will leave it there. I, it, it, it is, I suppose, a, well, they are architectural motif guidelines for the town of Jasper. So they apply here. I, I can't say that whether or not there are similar motif guidelines um, in other park communities. Um, and in Beth, I don't think they would apply because Beth has its own um, power over, over land use planning and development. So um, specific, but federal in a sense, I don't. They, they get applied at the local level, interpreted, and opinions are expressed. But why they ought to be expressed on land use rather than something that actually requires an architect when they're architectural motif guidelines, Mr. Bison. I think I have one more question. Um, I can think of a restaurant or two that wouldn't have an option of having their patio sitting right in front of their space due to bike racks or benches or garbage cans. Will there be? Options for them. Uh, thanks very much, Councilor Halls, through the uh, American Oil Idea. I think we would have to look on a site by site basis. Uh, administration certainly will be willing to work with businesses. Uh, I think that the primary uh, consideration would be first uh, uh, agreement among the businesses in the local area that they're willing to support uh, if that, that use of the, the sidewalk. Um, we have to recognize that this is one where. Um, with your sidewalk is fine, um, and, uh, but if you start to intrude into somebody else's sidewalk, uh, that's where it's a municipality. I'm sure there's some, some discussion between businesses and other kind of apartment. But when it comes to municipal infrastructure, to the extent that it can be used, which not all can, we're not cutting down any street trees or uh, anything like that. And, and there are some good reasons why certain types of street infrastructure, you know, uh, garbage cans are located at certain points where um, we have high pedestrian. Like a fossil, um, it's a natural point of garbage collection. And uh, I've said that it's not as though they're immovable, and administration will work with businesses on a site by site basis to see what we can do where that if they had agreement with their adjacent businesses in the first place. Welcome. Welcome, Councilor Janelle. Great. Please excuse me. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Through you to Mr. Gibbon, and again, I preface this by saying I, I have no intent and no desire to enter into debate with administration. But before council enters debate, I just want to clarify um, administration's understanding on a couple of points that you raised. Firstly, um, I, I do appreciate that the recommendation is a recommendation that administration feels will be accepted or is likely to be accepted by parks and, and much of that is what drives the recommendation. I, my question is this, if, if council directs administration to apply for a discretionary use permit, including the parameters in schedule A, is council not then required on an appeal to apply and not deviate from those conditions? So that, what is the point of an appeal? A council has said, these are the conditions and somebody says, yeah, but I'm different. I, I need some relaxation. If council has already accepted the conditions, what parameters will council have to then vary the conditions? From an administrative perspective. Go ahead, Mr. Kim. Yeah, I, I don't know from an administrative perspective, Your Worship, that there's you know uh, justification. I think it's it's about a, a fairness perspective. If council uh, wishes to recognize the desire of the community and vary council's position um, on something about what should go forward. I mean, this really is council describing what it thinks is appropriate for Jasper. And uh, if the conditions listed on the national name makes sense to council, then say so. And if somebody comes, uh, business comes to council at some point in the future, says, Well, sure, you said that these, you know, these conditions points, you know, one to six, but what made sense to Jasper? Here's what I want to do, and here's why it makes sense to Jasper. And then you've got a valid argument to council, and council says, Okay, sure, we, we accept that. That's, that, that's a fun point. Um, our legislative context doesn't mean that council can't simply change our development. 
back to park say, well, we know we applied for conditions one to six, but we would like to counsel's judge if appropriate and do something different. Um, and so we would like to amend our approval. So, Your Worship, it, it is a bit cumbersome. Um, I think in any other community, if council approved a set of rules, uh, and somebody came forward and said, well, the rules don't make sense, I'd like you to change the rules, council would have the authority to say, you know, hear that argument and judge whether it makes sense or not, and say, no, well, you're right, that, that argument makes sense, we're going to change the rules. Um, here in Jasper, uh, council can set the rules in a way, they still need them to be sanctioned by somebody else through Parks Canada. Um, and so council on a good argument chooses to change or amend the rules that it's approved. We still need to go through that process to the other to the other body. So it is it is a bit cumbersome admittedly, but I think it does include an opportunity for the community to come forward to their elected officials and make an argument about what should and shouldn't be allowed. It was best that administration could come up with in our unique legislative context. Thank you, if I might, thank you. I appreciate that. So I think I, I understand the point then that an individual appeal would not be for a variance from the rules, but in fact, to change the rules, and then the rules would be changed for all. So fair enough, I understand that. In the same context, um, and again, perhaps a bit of a small issue, but in the flow chart for appeals, um, PDAS figures prominently and in fact um, conclusively at the end of the appeal process. Again, and, and not to debate this um, with administration, but PDAC is a planning and development advisory committee. So again, it presupposes that development parameters apply to use conditions. And I'm not sure that I am satisfied that planning and development advisory committee should have anything other than an advisory role on development, not on use. So I struggle with that. My particular question though is that, is it simply um, a shorthand um, way of indicating that um, the PDAC process will be used to conclude matters rather than saying as it does that PDAC itself will apply, apply um, its deliberations and either approve or deny because the circumstances, as I understand, in a proper development application for a variance, um, the planning and development advisory committee simply advises another individual in Parks Canada, I think called the Western Executive Director, who then makes a determination. And if that is the process, I think the public has a right to know that if there is an appeal and it goes to its ultimate conclusion, the decision will be made by an individual not residing in Jasper, who is employed by Parks Canada at kind of level of time. And I, I just want to clarify that there's not an intent by this document to in fact empower the planning and development advisory committee to become a decision making body. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, through Deputy Mayor Keller, I mean, that, that's exactly correct. So, uh, admittedly, the flow chart that's here uh, in the public document is a uh, simplified version of the process that would actually happen. Uh, Your Worship is exactly correct that PDAC that does not have, uh, as far as I understand it, decision-making authority, it is ultimately uh, federal bureaucrats that actually sign off on things. Um, and so, and there are a couple of levels of sign off uh, going through uh, both the uh, local uh, municipal uh, ability services office, the field unit superintendent, and up to the, uh, the executive that uh, is what you mentioned. So uh, this diagram uh, compresses all of that. You know, it could have just been as easily, uh, you know, parks for the ZMG application. But you know the the local process um, that would be visible to the public would stop at PDAC. You know they would not. The public uh, are not privy to anything like any recommendations from PDAC. They're not uh, presented uh, in a on a public forum. And that sign off isn't 
uh, you know, the other layers of sign off are not immediately obvious to the public. I think this represents what the public can see locally. Um, His Worship is correct that there are a number of other steps that happen behind the scenes and within the parks drugs. I'm quite happy to defer if you'll come back. I do have additional questions. Okay, I'll go to Councillor Hall and then I'll come back to the <laughs> Thank you, Deputy uh, I have a question about, I, I know it's sidewalk seating is the subject. Is it going to include the retail? In other words, the retail aspects to our use? So would a retail store with these parameters be for them as well? Deputy Mayor, uh, Mayor Keller, MP for Council Hall. Yes, that's correct. Uh, we are using the shorthand of the sidewalk seating. Uh, this can would be applied to all of our uh, uses that are allowed under the commercial use of public space municipal bylaw. Um, that said, we had zero participation from retail stores. Uh, we heard from the Chamber of Commerce that there are, are barriers to retail stores and additional staffing. They've had concerns about the tuition of their uh, of their goods. So it's unlikely in the administration's view, and certainly from what we heard from the Chamber of Commerce of the retail stores. That said, uh, if a retail store wished to to use this, uh, they certainly could. No. Thank you again. Just on that point alone, and I hadn't thought of this earlier, but if, if I may again, um, if the requirement is that the walk around is the only solution, then there is a business on Patricia Street that has been using parking lanes for business other than a restaurant for many years, which could not be regularized. They couldn't use the sidewalk. A walk around would be of no benefit. Um, and a business which I think perhaps has been somewhat offside could not be regularized, even though there might have been an intent to allow. Oh. Sorry for just throwing. Um, I do have um, three questions, um, and I think I'll quick um, with respect to the recommendations and the alternatives, the options. Firstly, in previous years, has it been the municipality of Jasper or another agency that has made a discretionary use permit application, or has it been left to individual businesses? The junior color and his worship. Uh, my understanding is that uh, last year was actually the Jasper Park Chamber of Commerce that applied for discretionary use permit that did go through the PDAC process um, where they made recommendations to the Parks Administration that led to the approval for the final season um, with the explicit understanding that it was a pilot use. And so my understanding was that it went through uh, the Jasper Production Workers Council. Um, with respect to the alternatives, um, again, just for information, I guess that um, in the first alternative, that the committee perhaps provide different parameters. So, in the schedule, um, the view of administration is that the parameters attached as conditions now are likely to. Get approved, but other conditions are unlikely to get approved or not likely to get approved. It's, how would you qualify that? Uh, thanks very much, uh, Your Worship. True um, Deputy Mayor Keller. I mean, uh, administration has essentially pre qualified these if we, if we could use that sort of term loosely uh, with Parks Administration. Uh, we think that these are likely to be approved. Uh, we have not tested any other conditions, and so we don't know if they're likely or unlikely to be approved. I think if it would be fair to say that if council started to provide for installations that move closer to requiring to develop our sort of building permits, and we'll just keep that distinction there. There's, there's the use, what are you gonna use this land for? Um, there is the um, development, what are you actually sort of, what, what are you generally going to be building? And then there's specifically um, shows the construction of what you're proposing to build. And so we start to get to, more in depth construction, there are other laws like building code that apply. And so, council started to provide for uh, conditions that would start to get into um, heavy, heavier duty construction, both areas, and that would start to go into building permits, which is actually very specific. 
Um, all of the administration's, administration's recommendations here are intended to stay away from that area. Um, if council wanted to provide other conditions um, with respect to uh, colors or logos or jersey barriers or whatever else, we, we don't know exactly how that would work. Parks and administration would take your direction and take that forward through the process that's outlined before. So it really is up to council um, in discussions with parks and administration. We believe these, these ones would be uh, very likely to be approved. Um, and but then this, this would likely sail through um, other things and may require additional discussion. Um, but council wishes administration to take those forward. That's why you are elected to represent the community. We'll take your direction. Thank you, Pat. And if I may, I think my, my last question for administration um, with respect to the second of the alternatives that are listed, that is that. Committee direct administration to open the sidewalk seating program for applications without submitting a discretionary use permit application. Does that alternative option presuppose that individual businesses would first have made a discretionary use permit application, or does it suppose that we don't really care whether you do or not? Make your application to us without having one for a and we will do it. Through Deputy Mayor Keller, it's, it's the second viewership. Um, that uh, alternative would uh, suggest that the municipality would have full responsibility and, and ability to provide a municipal use permit under our municipal bylaw, and that there would be no uh, expectation for businesses to go through the Parks Canada process. But the caveat uh, that uh, a couple of important caveats on that and why it is not administration's recommended option. First, um, a business shows up and they start to get the building permitting. That is clearly would have to go up to the area of parks jurisdiction that we have to send forward. Um, it's not clear to administrate, it's not exactly clear what enforcement mechanisms uh, parks might have. The municipality chose to take. Uh, the approach recommended in that final bullet. Um, and it, because, uh, because of that lack of clarity about what the consequences of that might be, the administration is recommending it. But it, isn't, it also isn't clear to the administration what enforcement mechanisms parts may have. Um, there may be uh, reputational relationship risks uh, you know, between the municipality and Parks Canada, um, and it may pose some uncertainty uh, risk for businesses. Um, but again, it also isn't clear that uh, there would be an enforcement mechanism if the municipality chose to take that approach. So I'm not certain that there is a mechanism for parks to uh, object to that if the council chose that approach. Again, because there is so much uncertainty associated with that alternative, that, that administration is recommended. Thanks for me. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Go back to point six and Mayor Ireland or yourself in, in a response to Mayor Ireland um, talked about the colors and I noticed the primary colors um, aren't included in the palette of colors in the conditions. Yet I can think of numerous homes, businesses, awnings, canopies, uh, highlights on buildings that actually do have red, yellow, and blue. And when they talk about a neutral color, um, by excluding the primary colors, how do businesses differentiate themselves on the street when they may be known by their colors or a combination of colors or you know, want to make a distinction from their neighbor who uses one color and they have a color that may be associated with their particular business? Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Keller Murphy for Council Malik. Uh, I think that that is a fair point and a fair consideration. Uh, I will just say that from the administrative perspective, uh, we, in consultation with parks, judge that these would be conditions that parks would be very comfortable in approving. Um, if the municipal council wished to remove that requirement uh, or bury that requirement in the conditions, that would be up to you and the administration would take that forward to parks and, and argue for that position. Um, I think you make a reasonable point. And there's probably a bit of a judgment between uh, providing a consistent, uniform uh, aesthetic 
to the entire town site um, versus uh, allowing for that individual expression and individual identification of different businesses. Um, I think that what you're seeing here is consistent with um, intended practice uh, from parks. Um, but again, it's up to council, and, and that's why we provided the alternative for you to um, provide uh, different parameters for the submission process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, a quick question. The last couple of summer seasons, the Jersey Barrio barriers of public tents have been allowed because we're recovering from a pandemic. Is that the reason parks is allowed? Yes. You know, I, I think, and again, I came uh, only into the second uh, pilot season, but my understanding was that, that there was wide acknowledgement across the team, both within the municipality, uh, the school administration, and within the Parks Canada administration, that there needs to be some additional supports for businesses uh, to allow them to continue to operate uh, through the pandemic. And that's why there was that, uh, that really broad flexibility. I think what we're transitioning into is a bit of uh, trying to regularize this program so that, uh, because it, there's obviously demand, uh, there was interest from the public, it was you know, well adopted, and now everybody, uh, municipal administration, uh, Parks Canada, are trying to figure out, okay, so what should the rules look like going forward? Um, and so I think you saw a lot of variation, a lot of variety as a result of that sort of convergent or emergency uh, use approval over the last couple of years. And uh, what we're looking at now is how we transition to a more regularized program. I, I would argue that we're still in that that pandemic and businesses haven't recovered and i am nervous that I, I would i would support status quo for another year with lots of lots of looking at it throughout the summer and, and talking about it throughout the winter and, and coming up with a plan that works for everyone and i'm i'm worried about those businesses that don't have options to have a walk around but going into the summer to expect or to ask i think we need a few patios on the on Kanawha that have jersey barriers and pop-up tents that would be i don't know if they'd survive I don't know if they'd be able to survive. I, I like, do you think, like, I know you've asked, it's likely or unlikely, but one more year of, like, we're just, we're just starting to recover. Go ahead. So, so to be clear, you know, Deputy Mayor Hall, uh, for you through, uh, sorry, uh, Councilor Hall, that's what he's saying over the last couple of weeks. <laughs> Councilor Hall, uh, for you through Deputy Mayor Keller. Uh, just to be clear, um, the one more season of, of irregular use is provided for at 0.5%. Right. So, so, is said, well, so uh, somebody can continue to do what they did last year with the exception of tents uh, or umbrellas or Jersey barriers having advertising logos and non course. So if you had, well, no, it did, had somebody had bright pink Jersey barriers last year, they could continue to have Jersey barriers, they just should take them to gray. Is, is essentially the recommendation. So if, if, if administration was trying to find a balance of allowing uh, some flexibility in the 2022 season as we recover um, while moving towards a more uniform model. Thank you, Mr. Well, there are a lot of uh, different arguments that I have to not support this um, just because of some of the, the issues that Councillor uh, Melnick mention one about colors uh, my jacket is blue it's considered a neutral color uh, the fact that you know we're specifying them i think it's just that's a, it's a little bit of a stretch uh, i know that we're trying to appease uh, some type of not real regulations the other thing too is the, the setup and tear down of um, you know the, the walk arounds I mean, it's, it's hard enough for people to store Jersey barriers and uh, the demand that that puts on, on a business to, to either move in whole or tear up uh, or set up and tear down every year, plank by plank or whatever it may be, and then matching hold every, every single time to do that inspection and, and so on and so forth. So to me, I, I understand that, you know, that we're providing an opportunity here for people to um, expand, enhance. Uh, their businesses, but at the same time, you know, at what cost does, does it come to? Um, like many of my decisions, I, I try to filter it through, is this good for the community as a whole? Um, what are the costs? What are the fiscal implications? What are the social implications? And then is it the right thing to do? So uh, Mr. Given had, had 
made the point that if this was in our control and businesses came to us to review it and we saw the flaws in their argument, we'd say, okay, well, we have to go back and, and review it. So we know it's flawed right off the bat. Um, you know, the only problem is if we don't support anything going forward, what happens? You know, we're not going back for anything. So then parks would have full rule on it and then nothing's going to happen. Yes, and so we're kind of stuck between a rock and hard. So it's very frustrating. And, uh, you know, I, I'm quite close with a lot of people that will be facing some of these implications, and uh, and I feel their frustration. So um, I'm really hesitant to move forward with with what's in front of us. But at the same time, what do we do? Mr. Councilor Cronin, comments, questions. Um, I believe we have Mr. Jackson from um, Tourism Jasper on Zoom. If it was the village council, if you had something to say, are we happy to allow him to speak? He has a desk to open. Do we have a motion? Anna? Um, just on the, I don't want to get nitpicky here, but um, I apologize if this was addressed earlier. Who and how was it decided that the neutral colors were decided uh, between black, gray, white, brown, and blue? Uh, Deputy Mayor Keller MP for Council de Voda. Um, so administration has essentially pre qualified the conditions listing attached to uh, with Parks Canada. So that's through consultation with Parks Canada administration to identify what would uh, likely be supported. I, I, like I said earlier, that we're going sort of hopefully we think that these would sort of sail through these conditions. Uh, to be clear, uh, the report is here for Council Direction Council, and that's why the, uh, the first alternative is there that by different parameters for submission for our So I appreciate the challenge that uh, you raised, Council, but you know, this is, may not feel exactly right. Um, that's why it's here for the committee can tell us what feels exactly right to all of you, and then administration will, will take that forward for us to that submission. So um, this is not a table that we have proposal. Uh, this is administration doing some homework to identify what's likely to be supported. And if the committee wishes us to take forward something different, um, then we will certainly make our best argument in the parks on the other direction. Oh, sorry. If I need to shout out, that's fine. I appreciate it. Um, well, going forward with that, you know, again, a neutral color, if we don't have the colors in there, is up to the perception of whoever is going to, um, you know, have the discretionary use permit or whatever it is. So um, I'm hesitant to have colors in there. Um, I will put all the colors in there because all colors can be neutral, uh, depending on what hue or shade they are. Uh, so, you know, I, I think. Uh, Councillor Mellon did make a good point. I know that you know this is getting down into the nitpicky stuff on this, but I, I don't want because if somebody does uh, appeal, it, it has to go through PDAC, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. So that could hinder the process even further if they want to have their own colors matching the business colors. Deputy Mayor Keller, it's a process that's aligned in the report. Um, if administration judges something is not fully compliant with, so you know, stuck up, we're proposing that the committee give direction on the parameters. Uh, <coughs> based on that direction, the committee uh, administration would take forward an application on behalf of the municipality for a community wide development permit, uh, discretionary use permit. Um, then, after we receive that approval, um, somebody came in with something that appeared to the administration to be contrary to what was approved, the first level of appeal would be canceled. So if we said, you know that light pink is not a neutral color, for example, and, and uh, business made that argument to council, council said, no, we think that that light pink is a neutral color. Well, the administration would 
this is a correction for the year before. If it was a substantial difference from what we had submitted to the um, parks approval process, then we would amend and seek an amendment to our approval to the parks process. So again, the overhead is going to be the council, and there would be no expectation. There's no expectation in Western Park that any individual business goes through that parks process. Um, one caveat that I could that I can clearly tell to that is unless the business chooses an installation type that will part of the building from. There's nothing in the, the installation that's described and attached to wouldn't require any building permits. So the company some of the said, I want to build a few people from thing, but then decided to go into the building from the building. But uh, council brought up uh, the first level of appeal would be the municipal council. That the municipal council wanted to sanction something essentially change the rules based on that argument. Um, they could choose to do so, and then the school administration would go to parks for a request for an amendment or on the same topic, if I may just finish this one up. Um, would administration be put in an awkward position if we left number six with a period at the end of color, if not have the colors in the bracket? And would that would that put you and staff in kind of an awkward judgment position to keep that application? I think uh, so uh, through definition, <laughs> what I think administration will take whatever council direction is. And so if you want to have no period after color, um, I think that a term like neutral is pretty broad, as, as you correctly pointed out. Um, I think that that might increase the number of factors that would come from the administration would probably take a cautious approach to that, ensuring that we're not too offside of things that we think uh, we feel would come to parks' attention. Um, and so we would likely start to refer more things to council if they, if they, if they were, you know, if, if they were judgment calls. Uh, the more certainty the council can provide, the better. Um, and I think that's the approach that we've provided these uh, conditions. Uh, in is to say, we think that this provides a fair bit of clarity that would allow us to make uh, easy determinations in the administration without too many judgment calls. Because when it starts to come down to judgment calls, uh, and I think that is the challenge that's been observed with the um, architectural motif guidelines, because they are a bit subjective. And so when neutral in color is subjective, the recommendation here from the administration is to cue as closely as possible to what the parks directors Thank you for that. I uh, have to ask some tough questions sometimes just to get clarity and, and have it open for understanding. Um, Mr. Melnick, um, the President of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, would like to speak. Um, you okay with that? Uh, yes, yeah. I have. Yeah. Be? Hello, everyone. Thank you. Uh, uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you for the time, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, hello, MP. Um, I just, from the Chamber's perspective, at one point, um, Parks Canada reached out to a third party consultation. And the recommendation of that consultation was that the walkthrough was the preferred method. So, one question we have is why now is Parks going back against a consultation that they reached out for and recommending? The walk around when other businesses i think each business like many counselors have mentioned it needs to be unique to each setting and each setup of each business to give them a, a fair advantage or a fair opportunity to participate in the program as we are still coming out of covid many businesses have been closed all winter waiting to see what happens through covid um covid is not over yet for a lot of the sectors they're still recovering from years of being shut down or under restrictions so why is parks now determined to make it more difficult on the businesses with potentially um, making it going forward? The businesses would not have this opportunity to participate um, for some of them as well. The colors, I appreciate the debate on the colors um, for businesses. Part of their brand is, is their color. So I think it's important for them to be able to differentiate themselves from the, their neighbor. Um, if everyone is everyone has all black barriers, how do you know who who's who out on the street? Um, if anyone has any questions, 
uh, thank you for the time, the opportunity to speak. Any questions for Mr. Mayor? Thank you, Deputy Mayor keller um, Thank you, Mr. Melnick, for your engagement on behalf of the um, Jasper Park Chamber of Commerce. My question for, for you in that capacity um, and just having um, knowledge of various businesses in the community, what is the timeline that business will require in order to be prepared for a summer season, um, regardless of, of what that season might look like or what the parameters might be. That is to say, in, in shorter terms, what's the latest date that council could make a decision that would work um, for businesses to be prepared for the, for the summer season, if we accept that that begins on May 15th? I, I think, you know, we looked at a one year um, phase out was what has been decided. I think at the time the chamber was asking for two years just to give businesses time to to get back on their feet. And if they want to become compliant within that two years, maybe it is next summer for some businesses. But for others, it might take them two years and a full winter of being open and having the confidence that COVID is behind us to make that investment into um, what is going to be required with whether it is the walkthrough or the walk around with the, the boardwalk, um, cause it is significant and talking with, um, suppliers and trying to find contractors, like contractors are booking far, far out. And it might be something that needs to be built over the winter time and then be done in a way that is going to be feasible for multiple years going forward. Is wood the best way to go? Wood rots, wood, wood deteriorates is a composite material better that has a wood look or feel. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's something that should be discussed um, moving forward. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Mr. Lundman. Any other questions? Thank you for joining us this morning. Councilor Hall. I just had a, a quick question, um, maybe to put Mayor Ireland back on the spot. But I'm looking at the recommendation. I know, I know you had sort of worded out an alternate. I just wanted you to do Maybe repeat it so I can have that in my head as I was listening to all the other. It was a few minutes ago. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Councillor Hall. I, I'm not sure that I added an alternative. I just had Mr. Um, Given clarify in particular the second of the two alternatives that um, that would uh, assume that. We would simply accept the applications um, regardless of status. And if, if, if Mr. Dillon wants to, to reiterate if I got him wrong, I think the, the caution from an administrative perspective was that if we choose that second alternative, there is uncertainty. There is there is some uncertainty about whether or not parks can enforce what they want anyway, but it, it does leave the business sector in uncertainty. They would apply to us, we might say, go ahead, and somebody else might say, no, you can't, and, and they're they are caught in that dilemma. But I did question that, okay. that second of the two alternatives. Thank you. Mayor Island? Thank you, Mayor. I am waiting um, for a motion so we can debate. Um, I am not inclined um, particularly to the recommendation or to the alternatives. Uh, I think one of the critical factors here was very well expressed by Mr. Gibbon in his response to an early question about the appeal process. And he said, if that is the part that will become visible to the to the public, and that is the major problem here, is that too many aspects of this are invisible to the public. Um, and so my inclination, and I, I asked young Mr. Mel on screen about timing um, to see if I could get some some clarity around timing for us, but 
my inclination now, and under Section 194 of the Municipal Government Act, I could do it unilaterally and be required to do it on um, a request from the majority of councillors. And that is to call a special meeting. And it occurs to me that we have Tuesday next week, which is not now scheduled. And if the business sector can accommodate a week's delay, I think that they have not been sufficiently heard. Too much of this process unfolds um, in rooms where the public is not allowed. Um, it's not about the color in the palette. It's about whether there should be a palette at all. And I, I simply um, cannot accept the conditions. On the other hand, I understand that there is a business imperative to move this forward. Certainty has its own value. And even if it's the certainty of rules that nobody likes, maybe that certainty is better than, than uncertainty. So do we have a week to play with this? I am inclined, um, as I say, I have to do it unilaterally. I prefer to do it with the consent of council. To defer this question, call a special meeting for next Tuesday and invite either in this room or online members of the public to be engaged because I, I think that without that degree of engagement, whatever decision we make will be subject to uh, second guessing by all. And I would rather have more on the table than less. So that would be my inclination uh, simply to defer this question to a special meeting and invite members of the public and hold it in, in the sense of a, like a public term. And let people voice um, concerns that they have so that we can make a fair and considered decision at the end of that and then address our stand. That's a good idea. Councillor Jamal. Thank you. And, and I fully support that. I think it's a great idea. And I think we should take advantage of opportunities like that when we have availability in the schedule, especially. Um, I like the direction. I think it's the smart thing to do, it's the right thing to do. And uh, I'll make myself available. Great idea. Um, one other thing that I want to address is like, you know, we talked about the flow chart and everything. Um, there's still a bit of a, to me, um, when we when you go down the flow chart and you talk about the, the application and, and whether it's, it's fully consistent, whether it gets disputed or not, it's going to end up in the same place regardless. So, um, and, the, and that's just for this year's approval. So there might be something that might cause it to go in a different direction, but I just to me it's it's a little frustrating. So I'd I'd like to hear more from the business community, the people affected by this, and and even more so um, members of Brown. Thank you. Council, could we or would it be appropriate to invite someone from part of um, one of our partners in Parks Canada to a meeting? Yes, answer questions from that we wouldn't be able to answer. Um, Members of the public are always invited. No. Our okay. Canada is a member. I, I don't think I would be inclined to send a special invitation. I mean, they are an authority in their own right. They can conduct business as they choose, and I think we should conduct business as we choose. So if, if they do show up, um, they would be most welcome. So Mara, do you um, think about when you have a special meeting at 1.30 next Tuesday as a regular meeting? I'm open to to the time that if there is um, generalized agreement that if that is a way to go, I, I would be happy to make a motion. Um, and we can, whether it's 9.30 or 1.30, it's immaterial to me, I suppose it's... We're trying to attract um, interest from the public. Um, so whatever might be, be best, I don't know what time of day is best for us. I have a conflict that morning. I have a special meeting with Community Futures at 1.30, but I think 1.30 would be better for me, or 11, any time after it would be an hour. Well, I, I will make a motion then, um, just to advance things a bit, that um, committee, for consideration 
of this request for a decision to a special meeting of council to be held at 1 30 p.m. on Tuesday, March 29th. Yeah. Councilor Monique. The order is to make to second that motion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Councilor Monique. All in favor? Carried. Do you have enough direction, Mr. Gibbons? Uh, yes, absolutely. Thanks very much, uh, Deputy Mayor Calderanti. So, administration will bring forward the existing report uh, to Council on March 29th at 1 30 p.m. I want to ensure that the Chamber of Commerce and the public are aware, uh, as well as Bruce and Jasper. Um, and then uh, the expectation would be that any interested parties would be here to express their views on the existing report. Um, we did not hear from administration to hear from Council on the direction for amendments. Essentially, the referral is referring. The report was presented today um, to this uh, new opportunity. Thank you, uh, Councillor Kelvin, uh, Deputy Mayor Keller. Um, where are we at procedurally uh, for setting that special meeting? Do we need a separate motion for that? And are we allowed to do that too? We don't. Um, under the provisions of Section 194, I think they already have um, direction from the majority of council. And as I said earlier, I can do it on my own. Anyway, I, I choose not to in this circumstance. So relying on I think, um, 141, or pardon me, 194B, um, I have that direction so I can call them. It's just an administrative matter, but we don't need a further motion. I figured you were confident in that. I just want to make sure. Seeing that it is nearly quarter to 11, I'm going to call a short recess to 10.50, and uh, we'll see you all back then. Welcome back, everybody. Um, so now we're on to 6.2, 2018-2022 Council Strategic Priorities Review. Thanks very much, uh, Deputy Mayor Kelly Rampey. Uh, I'm not sure Councilor Waxer is back. Is he coming on screen there? Um, administration is presenting to Council a, a brief review of actions related to the 2018 to 2022 strategic plan. Uh, the recommendation here is that we can you simply receive this report for information. Uh, in February of this year, Council requested administration provide an update uh, made on uh, the items identified in 2018 to 2022. Plan. That plan contains six priority areas as uh, listed in the report. And you'll see a table uh, over a couple of pages, a very colorful table over a couple of pages attached that attempted to identify as best as possible uh, some of the actions that the municipality took related to specific items uh, where we could identify that as administration. I'll just provide the caveat uh, a couple. First, that this is uh, with significant turnover within administration. So your CAO position is turned over over the course of that term. Uh, we've had a changeover in our directors and maybe uh, there's some more knowledge that might be lost. But more importantly, I think uh, we need to acknowledge that the last council term uh, really was defined by the outbreak of the pandemic. And so uh, action towards the priorities that were identified in 2018 uh, really uh, adjusted uh, early in 2020 as council, community, and split administration had refocused the efforts on COVID response. Uh, so I, I, I think I would provide that for this council's you know, consideration in the community. Um, but having said that, uh, administration does have a list of a number of items where the council uh, and the organization have made significant process, uh, sorry, progress on uh, some of the items that were identified in, in the plan. Uh, I think this is helpful information for council to consider uh, both the specifics of you know, what has happened, but also maybe just as you're thinking about your strategic planning process, how might you phrase something um, or what would be the strategic directions that you phrase uh, so that can be acted upon? And uh, I would do that council to consider. Um, but uh, administration was requested by this information. I hope that it be used by the council. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilor Manley. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Keller. And I would like to just express my appreciation to administration. Um, this was at my request, and I am happy to see that how comprehensive the report is, and I do feel 
that the information will help us while we're in doubt as we uh, do look at the strategic plan for the next four years. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? I also would like to express my thanks to Mr. Schumann and his team for putting this together for us. Community conversations report. Uh, just before we move from that mm -hmm. item, uh, thank you, Mayor Governor. I think just in terms of process, uh, maybe a motion to receive for information that way there was an agenda yeah. and, and something happened with that agenda. Okay. One way or the other. Uh, just before we do that, I'm happy to make a motion um, to receive for information, but I, I just wanted to confirm. Oh, I can't tell you the page number yet. Maybe somehow I can. Um, the second colorful page it has bright yellow at the bottom. Really desirable. Uh, up in the upper right hand section, can you just confirm that there's a word missing there that it should be co investment housing model? Not the co housing model? Thanks very much, Your Worship. Yes, uh, the co investment housing model is subject to that small change. I I move that council set the report as information, and I thank the administration for having put it together, and I thank Councilor Mellon for having the request. All in favor? Carried. And it's actually 6.3 municipal staff housing. Mr. Gibbons. Thanks very much, Deputy Mayor Keller Rempe. On September 14th uh, last year, committee uh, requested administration draft a policy to address all aspects of municipal staff housing. Um, and so uh, we are presenting that draft policy for council uh, consideration. Um, it is obviously widely acknowledged that Jasper's housing market is unique uh, and essentially tightly constrained, um, characterized by a low supply low vacancy rates and generally high costs. Um, this housing situation presents a barrier for employers and municipality of Jasper as an employer uh, faces those same barriers. Um, the lack of available affordable housing presents a barrier to recruitment and retention of qualified staff, which in turn uh, impacts our ability to provide municipal services to the community. And the council has a very clear understanding of that both from your business lives um, and from your uh, involvement Community um, administration on a bit of a uh, review across jurisdictional stand uh, saw in similar municipalities that would face similar constraints like Whistler and Bam. Uh, the municipality typically takes an active role in housing. Um, and there are, uh, I'll speak to some examples so that the Whistler and Bam policies are attached for your information. Um, the municipality of Jasper has taken an active role in staff housing. Uh, we have an inventory of properties that are owned by the municipality. We have uh, two sides of duplex and one single family home. Uh, additionally, the municipality leases uh, from a private owner uh, a six bedroom house uh, that we have available and that's typically used for uh, seasonal or temporary staff. Um, in the past, the municipality has not had a policy covering this area. And so, administration is uh, making some recommendations that you'll see in the attached draft. The highlights include the commitment, obviously, to comply with the Alberta Residential Dependency Act, which would be sort of a base consideration. Um, the uh, some direction on how rents should be set um, at lower of 15% below the Jasper market rate, and that speaks to a little bit to how the administration would propose to uh, establish what the Jasper market rate is, uh, or 30% of the employee's gross monthly income, which is an accepted standard for affordable housing. Uh, both in Alberta and nationally. Uh, and there would also be a commitment to ensuring uh, maximum occupancy of employee housing units. Um, I think the municipality um, would be desirable for the municipality to ensure that there are not units that are vacant when there are other people who are unhoused or inappropriately housed. So the policy provides opportunities to work with the private sector uh, if we have uh, units that are not required for municipal purposes. Um, also considers that. It also makes specific provisions uh, for different types of municipal employees. Um, first, there are full-time employees that essentially are recruiting into the community 
and the opportunity for them to have some transitional housing because they can locate with you with the expectation that would be for a limited time period. Um, and then separately, some consideration for seasonal or term employees who would not expect to be expected to stay in Jasper on a long term basis. Um, so I think that essentially your summer employment uh, would have to staff up for a few summer season, and then that staff would uh, likely return to the campus for. Uh, um, and as I noted, uh, the intention is that uh, to ensure that maximum occupancy, that we would not leave the units um, uh, vacant. And you know, it's a case where we would be vacant, but we would have the ability to work with the private sector or other other employers to ensure that those units are used. So the draft is here for council consideration, um, and the administration is happy to answer any questions. Um, if any wishes, uh, they can direct the administration to uh, approve the policy as presented. Which is our administrative recommendation. Uh, the committee could also uh, identify amendments they wish to see to the policy and direct the administration to um, return with an amendment policy, or they could make amendments and send a policy to the council. That's all we have for you, Deputy Mayor Keller. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions? Councilor Mayor. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Chandler Hampton and through you to Mr. Given. Um, one point I saw 3.3.3.1 where the transitional housing uh, shall not exceed 36 months. And I found that to be overly generous. Um, any thought process why 12.4, three years is a long time to be in a, will, will be typically your. Trying to establish yourself in a new community. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Council Melman, through Deputy Mayor Keller. Uh, administration, you know, that certainly is a variable up to what the Council's consideration you know, and desire is. Um, we we would want to find a balance to ensure that they're, you know, we're recruiting somebody to the community, um, that we are able to provide them some sense of stability that we're essentially asking. And I've gone through this recently myself, um, you know, the consideration of saying, well, come to Jasper. Uh, from somewhere else, uh, relocate your, your, your family, um, and we have housing for you, um, and, and this is our housing market. I think that that a longer term uh, may be necessary, uh, given the tight market in Chelsea. Certainly from somebody from the outside looking, uh, my first step was to look at the NLS listings. If you look at that today, there's one house on the market. So for somebody from another community, that can provide a significant amount of uncertainty um, that might uh, impact their decision to go to Jasper community and the administration. Uh, the council felt that a shorter term made sense. It's your, it's your policy. Yes, I think from an administrative view, uh, the desire would be to help employees transition into regular housing in the community. Um, I think having a client endpoint provides that uh, incentive to act. Uh, I think it's an open question of age. So how much certainty do we need to give somebody to encourage them to move to Jasper? Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Given. Just a few questions, but some observations as well. And I, I appreciate um, the policy statement, but you know, I wonder about. Um, the use of the word retention. I, I recognize that the categories of housing that we may offer um, certainly affect recruitment, um, but because they are all time um, not, I'm not so sure that they, they deal with retention in the same sense. And also, I wonder whether in the policy statement there is a slight disconnect with item 3.3.3 so that. The policy statement says we may provide rental housing for employees of the municipality. Municipality we capitalized, so that is the municipality, but 3.3.3 provides that some of that employee housing may be allotted to people who are not employees of the municipality from time to time. So I, I would prefer to see a little bit more consistency between the policy statement and and the actual outcome. Not that I disagree with what is proposed, but it's not exactly covered by the policy statement in my view. Um, and just two wording issues um, that I have. 
um, with the rental rate limitation, so the lesser of 15% below Jasper market rate or 30% of the employees gross monthly income. That might be defined somewhere. It's not defined in this policy. And I would just suggest that we might add um, to that phrase 30% of the employees gross monthly income from all sources, because it's certainly possible that in this community, people who work for the municipality also have other jobs and it would not be the employee's gross income from the municipality um, that is being determined. So I, I would simply suggest that it is a collective um, gross income that should be used as a measure to state for um, what becomes subsidized housing. And finally, in 3.3.1, um, I would be more inclined to say that people are waiting for market housing to become available rather than a suitable dwelling. I think I just enters into a realm of subjectivity. I, I don't know what suitable might mean, um, but we are encouraging people with transitional housing, hoping that they get into the market sooner rather than later. Otherwise, very much like the post policy thing. That's it, Well, why don't you wait? Because I, I don't have any questions on it. And I do appreciate uh, the conversation on those adjustments because uh, I think that's good insight. Uh, I do want to thank administration deeply for uh, getting this uh, in front of us. Um, I think it's going to help us in some future decision making down the road when it comes to uh, maybe having a conversation on accessing more housing um, for staff. And uh, you know, we could go forward with that uh, until we have this in front of us. And, um, and now that we have in front of us you know, detail, the quality of detail uh, really gives us a good process and outline and understanding of uh, attracting and maintaining staff. So, I have a councillor willing to make a motion. Councillor Dunn. Thank you for allowing me to do that. I would like to move that committee recommend council approve the municipal employee housing policy as amended. Any other debate? I need some suggestions. There's no clarity that that was accepted by anybody. Um, so, I, from administration's perspective, um, I think they deserve to know what those amendments are and whether they are approved by council. We don't have a specific wording, but um, there is a generalized understanding that I think it's fair for council to let. Administration know exactly what they expect to come back to council for final approval. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, with those suggestions that the mayor um, made, if the rest of council is comfortable in understanding what those are and administration is comfortable, um, and me using the term amended in the motion, are we clear on what's going to come back to us next week? Or Thanks very much, Councilman. Uh, through Deputy Mayor Keller, so the those amendments that amendment that I heard, and so maybe it'll, it'll, it is exactly the, the right to make sure that we're all on the same page. Yeah. The things that I heard were uh, in the policy statement to remove the word retention uh, and, and to really focus policy on recruitment. Uh, so the attention is to uh, provide long term housing, um, so it's a, to enable recruitment. Um, so we can make that amendment. Uh, under 3.2, uh, an amendment to include, to recognize uh, the employee's total gross monthly income from all sources. Uh, I think this is the intention there. Um, under 3.3.1, um, employees relocating Jasper waiting for market rate uh, 
trademark of the law, uh, rather than being sued the law. Uh, and then the, the other point uh, that his worship brought up, uh, they didn't record a change. So that, those are the ones that I heard that I would have presented for the council. council. So there's one that I was not proposing uh, that I didn't capture and propose to present the council, and I'll just highlight that. Um, and that was the discussion about the off season use and this consideration of you know, the, how the policy statement doesn't speak to that necessarily. And that is, I think, with intention. Um, the municipality of Jasper, and the, policy, the policy statement says the municipality of Jasper provides housing to our employees uh, for these reasons and under these conditions. And when we have a vacant one, the administration are okay to work to make sure those units are utilized. So, if, you know, that the core purpose of the policy, the policy statement, are not focused on a municipality being a provider of employee housing for other entities. Um, and I just contrast this policy with uh, Whistler, where their housing body is explicitly that you know, provide employee housing for all different types of uh, employers. And BAM, which explicitly is for municipal purposes and what they call associated agencies like Paris and others. I think that um, as proposed, uh, the policy statement says for purpose in doing this is for municipal employees. Full stop. 3.3 says, but don't leave it in danger. If somebody else can use it because we're not using it, go ahead, administration, and put that in there. You're allowed to do that. Um, so, Your Worship, that, that I didn't. That, that's the only one that I wouldn't have brought forward. I just want to make sure that was clear for everybody. And if there's a desire to make a change, then let's be happy with that question. Mayor? Yes, thank you, Deputy Mayor of Governor NBA. I can accept that and I, I appreciate it. My, my concern in raising it is that the policy statement does not provide, it is permissive. Um, and I like that. So we may provide rental housing for employees, but within the standards, um, we are not in some circumstances providing rental housing for employees. We're providing rental housing for others. And I accept that it's a wise use of the asset, but it seems to me to be contrary to the permissive policy statement that says, it might be used for this. If, if it's occupied by somebody other than an employee of the municipality, are you offside the very policy? That's why I threw it out there. I, from a practical perspective, I absolutely agree with 3.3.3. If, if we don't have a need for it, occupy it by somebody who is not an employee. But are you entitled under the policy statement to do that? So, and, and this may be a part of uh, our evolving approach to policy. I think in the past, uh, many municipal, policies, many council adopted policies were based on only the policy statement. And so, uh, I think in that in that practice, the mayor's point about needing additional clarity about what is what is allowed or required in the policy statement. Under this proposed approach, our evolving approach, where there's more detail, including council policy, we have finer grain control. And so rather than making sure that every specific consideration is contained in the policy statement, you also get control over some of the details of the policy. And that's where the standard section. So that the policy is adopted by council as a whole, from one to, one to five. All of those points are council's policy. And if we're acting in accordance with the Totality of council policy that are on site. Um, and in this case, that includes 3.3.3, which sort of provides that off ramp for the off season use. Um, if council feel better about having that specific ability referenced in the policy statement, it is totally fine for the administration. It, it's just by the additional level of detail. I don't know that it's necessary because council has approved this additional use under 3.3, which is already. The whole package is houses. Are you happy with that, Mary? I can certainly um, accept it. I, I would have only added the word 
primarily in the policy statement. We provide rental housing primarily for employees of the municipality. But I, I understand, and because we are approving a policy with the specifics mm -hmm. of 3.2.3, um, doubt is probably the I just personally prefer a higher degree of consistency, but I can live with what Mr. Gibbon has presented. Well, um, I was going to suggest using the, the word primary um, in, the, in the statement itself, because I, I really like how your approach was that may uh, does, the word may gives us the flexibility, but at the same time, it doesn't really address the primary um, use so or purpose. So I, I'm comfortable with that. If, if that's okay by council, and then I was just going to open it up with, uh, you know, 3.3.3, 3, uh, I believe. Um, if council wants to put any discretionary use on using the terms such as agencies or municipal park, I just not have that open to just anybody, you know, making reference to, to that different things. So just part of the discussion, and that's okay to have the debate. You know, I know there's a motion on the table, but um, you know, I, I'd like to hear a little more if people do have other concerns on uh, the semantics. So thank you, Deputy Mayor Calvary. I, I will say that I specifically looked at those other um, examples that were given and turned my mind to the question of agencies that has been done elsewhere. And, Prefer the model that is before us that is silent on that. From, from my perspective, it's, it's better to let them. Um, so, if I may reach out, uh, Deputy Mayor Keller, I'll be to uh, Mayor Ireland again. Um, if I was going to amend my motion, um, is, would that be a friendly amendment coming from you to put the we're primarily in there, or? Um, with or without it, I am content. I, my, my reason for raising it in the context of the motion was to ensure that administration and council were on the same page with respect to what the amendments look like. Um, so, um, yes, if, if you wish to, to change and add that, I, I have no objection to that. But, I'm not in a position where I would vote against the motion, <clears throat> but in the absence of that. Would... Okay, so going forward with the amendments made, I would like to uh, also propose uh, the amendment to uh, the policy statement to include uh, housing. Um, Provide rental housing primarily for employees. Um, I'm not sure if Everybody okay with that? Any other debate on the motion? Shall I call the question? All in favor? Carried. Thank you, Councillor DeMoto. Thanks to administration. Good work. Community conversations report, which is attached. Very well done, I have to say. And Mrs. Riddell, awesome work. I'll hand it over to you, Mr. Kevin. Sure. Thanks very much, uh, Deputy Mayor Keller. And the, uh, attached is the uh, our first iteration of the community conversations report following the recent adoption of our new community conversations policy. Um, I believe uh, Ms. Riddell. Uh, is uh, here and Mr. Reed is here as well. Um, and uh, they can obviously speak in details of the report. I would just say that uh, this is an evolving process. And one of the things, um, in addition to the content that we're interested in council's views on, um, is the format. And so if you have any feedback on the formatting or the, the way the information is presented or the, the level of detail, uh, we'd be happy to hear that as we evolve this practice over the coming year. Um, as we see more of this report. So I'm going to turn it over uh, to Mr. Reed first and uh, his team uh, to introduce the report in specifics. Uh, thank you, CAO, given uh, through Deputy Mayor Keller MP to Council. 
Um, I don't have much to say, of course. Um, Ms. Riddell is our resident expert on community conversations. Um, I, I will only say that this has been a very impressive uh, five weeks I've been here now. This has been one of the strongest um, portions of learning this new job. I'm very impressed with how this process is going and I'm really looking forward to hearing how council receives this information. So without any further ado, I will just pass it right over to Ms. Riddell. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Thank you, Mr. Reed, and uh, through Deputy Mayor Keller MP and all of Council, good morning. Uh, in front of you, you have the first iteration of the report on the first quarter of Community Conversations. So the report in front of you summarizes the first three months of Community Conversations that took place between January and March 2022. Um, this is following the approval of the Community Conversations policy, which took place September 21st. So administration took the direction in the policy and set out to establish a format for community conversations, as well as to promote the opportunity in the community and recruit participants. The first report summarizes all of the trends and opportunities identified it over the past quarter. And going forward, a CAO given indicated administration would like to know what level of detail committee wishes to see in future reports. Um, for this first one, we aired on the side of caution and just included everything. <laughs> During January, <laughs> February and March, uh, 63 individuals took part in at least one community conversation. Many of those individuals attended more than once. So we have a non-unique total attendance of 187 between all 20 conversations that took place. There were participants from the public, private, and nonprofit sectors participating regularly. Of the 63 unique participants, 29 are municipal employees. 21 are from the nonprofit sector, three are from the business sector. However, it is worth noting that two of those three uh, participants are the Chamber and Tourism Jasper, so representing quite a few businesses. Two are from other levels of government, and five are just individual community members. Between all of those participants, it creates a uh, really rich mix of perspectives that are being shared. The adults conversation has the highest unique participation at 25, and the arts and culture has the lowest currently at 14. For the first three months, participants took part in a series of activities. So in January, we identified trends, participants shared what they were each noticing. And as is often the case when we're talking about challenges, opportunities always come out too, and those were documented. In February, the group picked up two of the opportunities that we thought could use some fleshing out and brainstormed what kind of things do we have to do to get there, to seize these opportunities. Um, and then in March, the groups were engaged in refining the notes, making final changes to the list of trends and opportunities, and of course, indicating their support that the notes were ready for this report. So with more than 135 opportunities identified, community development reviewed all of them and grouped them into 13 thematic areas which helped to form sort of that overarching priority, um, what kinds of priorities the community is looking at right now and, I, and identifying. So those areas are access and use of technology, financial stress, communication, social connection, use of community spaces, mental health support, learning and training, transportation, promoting acceptance around COVID-19, environmentally sustainable choices, communication around environmental responsibility, energy use and waste, and engaging children and youth in environmental responsibility. So part of this is um, measuring success. This is a new step to be doing so many more conversations this year. So in March, we surveyed participants just to gain insight into their experience over the first three months. The feedback was generally positive and there were some great suggestions as well that will help inform our process moving forward. Each week after community conversations, community development has a follow-up discussion to identify quick wins things we can do easily in response to what we're hearing in our community. And in the past quarter we created, so these are examples of those, we created the masking signage that you see around town in response to a discussion about how um, unified messaging around restrictions and just promoting kindness would be really well received. We also took steps to support the food rescue program and are planning on situating the community fridge in the Jasper Activity Center so that it can stay op operational and really accessible to the community all summer long. And another example is we'll be creating an email uh, list so that uh, Director of Community Development, Mr. Reed, can send out um, timely updates on the Activity Center renovation. 
So overall, the first quarter of community conversations produced really detailed opportunities. Um, and the format is accessible. So I do feel like it's important to take this opportunity for council and for anyone listening to remind folks that anyone can join if you live in the community or if you work for an organization that serves Jasper. And we do recognize that not everyone can make it to the scheduled conversations. We have a host your own community conversations initiative that's intended to make sure that we receive diverse cross-section of input from the whole community. The detailed report is attached, <clears throat> pardon me, and I am available to answer any questions I can as best I can. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trudeau, and thank you to your team. And it's been a pleasure being on the early childhood community conversations. I've really enjoyed it, and uh, this is an excellent report. Council questions. Councilor Demilla. Well, at the risk of uh, adding more rhetoric to a council meeting that I regularly do, um, I just wanted to, to say how appreciative I am about the process uh, entirely and, and what started out as community conversations uh, in some areas and, and having that morph and expand into, um, you know, going from actual committees and, and public engagement is really important. And for those of you that do take a public engagement course uh, down the road, um, this is kind of one of the things that I was looking forward to and coming to fruition when uh, we first started out on this adventure together. And how it's transpiring is inspiring. So thank you to all behind the scenes that are making this happen. Uh, those who planted the seeds to, to have it come to where it is today. And I really look forward to uh, growing this and making it a useful tool. Um, you know, one thing that, that we have to differentiate sometimes is communication to the public is a lot different uh, than, or communicating with the public than, than, and it's different than public engagement. And here we have an opportunity to provide two things at the same time. And I think it's really helpful for the community as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bond. Councillor Hall. I also too just want to express my appreciation for this report. I think it's uh, very timely uh, in, ahead of our strat planning sessions. When I was in Edmonton last week for my strategic planning uh, course, I was able to actually speak to the room about this um, program we have and as well as even people seem very tough. But thank you very much, Mr. Bell. This is a, an amazing report. Mayor Ireland. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Kevin Rampey. I, I too appreciate the report. I, I really do appreciate um, the new direction um, that was achieved after the really lengthy discussion, but I think these community conversations are the way to go. I am only going to suggest, however, that we keep a very close eye on the proportion of public members attending. Um, I had expected um, somewhat different numbers, and I think I'd say we're on the right track, but we have to watch when 46% of the participants are municipal employees. Um, it is not yet the community conversation I was hoping to have. Uh, and so I, I think it is on all of us to try and attract more individuals from the community um, to all of these sessions and to hear that voice. We, this should not be um, just an opportunity uh, at a sort of a 50 50 level um, to have some people engage with that many useful staff. So, as I say, I appreciate the report. Really interesting to have those numbers. I, I'm thankful that they are there, but I think it indicates that we still have ongoing work really make this what I hope to be a full community conversation and not limited um, with 46% of the participants being municipal employees. But I, I thank you for the report and I thank you for all the work. And I appreciate that there needs to be some municipal employees absolutely at each one of these conversations because individuals like Ms. Riddell and others who facilitate the conversation are absolutely indispensable in doing an excellent job. So, Thank you for that. Thank you, Mayor. 
Certainly, go ahead, Councilor Hall. Sorry to jump back in. Um, Mr. Dell, I have a question for you. Do, are these conversations recorded and then streamed after? The public can't be there on a Wednesday between one and three. Are they able to watch them at a later time? Thanks for the question, Councillor Hall. Um, through Deputy Mayor Councillor MP Tell Council, it's not uh, recorded and live streamed. Um, the notes from the conversations are also only shared with participants, like with um, folks that have signed up. So that isn't a step that we've taken at this time. Councilor Nona. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Kelleher, happy to you to Ms. Riddell. Um, I, I noticed that there are follow-ups on a number of things. Um, as things are put into place just on a policy, and I'll refer specifically to advertising to be done in a certain color was suggested by the seniors. Once that um, is put in place, will that drop off the list of items on the community conversations. Um, I mean, it's great to hear from uh, the individuals and if we incorporate that as a policy or as a, a going forward, does it really need to stay on this list? I'm just trying to think as we continue with the community, with the conversations, we're gonna have a lot of things on this list and, and uh, uh, it would be good to have a, a page where we parked what we've achieved for reference and isn't part of the overall um, uh, summary. And this is a very good summary. It, it, it captured so many things. Um, but we do need to keep the list manageable. Deputy Mayor Keller, if I could step in. Certainly. Uh, you know, I think from administration's perspective, um, the, the purpose of community conversations, and, and this is included in the policy, um, administration is on, on the lookout for quick wins, as uh, Mr. Dell identified, things that we can do within our current scope of, of authority and approvals from council and budget. Um, but there isn't an intention, I don't believe, that that next time you would see these items, plus a whole bunch of other new items. I think that you would see a whole new list of what the conversations mean over the course of the quarter. Um, and administration would identify, you know, any things that came up that we could act on, again, within our sort of current scopes. I think the purpose here would be for council to essentially be seeing this over the course of the, the year. And as you get to budget, thinking about the things that you had heard, um, if there are suggestions from the community for specific actions that are outside of the administration's current capacity or scope or something, um, then uh, if, you know, we would be obligated to come forward in some other form and propose that to council. Um, and you know there there uh, there may be those things occur through the course of community conversations if they were um, material and seemed in alignment with the direction the council set we would likely start to see us bring those to the council table but I think we want to be cautious about creating confusion in the community about well I, I've said something in community conversations so something should happen right like there, there's a bit of a dynamic tension there that administration is trying to balance. Uh, we'll sort through that uh, and we want to make sure that we're not uh, engaging in things that are outside for a group scope. Uh, and certainly, Mr. Dell and, and uh, Mr. Reed, their team have done a great job of acting on things where they said, hey, we, we can do that. We don't need direction to cancel. We can act on that. Um, so, don't expect to see these 200 items come back to you again with another 200 items and that us have to keep track of that. That's what our motion action list is for, where council has given us direction to come forward back to. Um, but for now, we want to make sure that council is, is seeing and hearing the sentiment of the community. And that's up to you to decide if there is something you want to hold in here and give us direction. Go ahead, Councilor Mayor. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Kellner. I bring it through you to Mr. Gibbon. Uh, thank you for the clarification. Um, and, and I do appreciate the, that that does add for me some clarity as to how we move forward. But also, I'd like to thank Councilor. Paul, um, it, this is important information to have going into the strategic planning. And I think well timed that this was brought up to us prior to us getting away. So thank you both, um, Mr. Nell and, and Mr. Reed for ensuring that, that this uh, had made it to the council table. Can I have a motion to receive the report? Sorry, Councilor Axel. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, I also wanted to thank uh, uh, Ms. Riddell for all of the work. There was lots of very interesting uh, information in there, and I really appreciate the um, attention to quick wins. Um, I think often those things can be small tweaks that w in the way we do business that can um, imp be improved. And uh, so I really appreciate that. I also wanted to speak to the fact that I think each of us as individuals in conversation with uh, community residents, um, reminding people that there is the opportunity to participate in any one of these community conversations. It's been my experience that uh, personal contact or face-to-face um, -face or uh, uh, conversations will help people uh, develop comfort for uh, joining these types of conversations. And I think speaking to what Mayor Ireland said, I think it is important to get a broader range of uh, people in the community actively involved in the process. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lecter. So, Councillor Bowen's make a motion to receive the report. Councillor Hall. And um, with a motion to receive the committee conversation report and recommendations for the first quarter of 2022 for information. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reed and Mr. Trudeau. Alberto Wintergain. Alberto, Mr. Given. Yes, thanks very much, Good uh, Mayor Keller MP. At the uh, last council meeting, um, on sorry, the previous meeting on March 8th, the uh, council received correspondence from Ross Alberta uh, asking if his colleague would like to submit a bid for upcoming Alberta Games. Uh, at that time, the community director and administration would reach out to our regional municipalities uh, just to inquire the, the, their level of interest. Um, I did that, um, so this report reports and that satisfy this, this direction from council. Um, in this dialogue with its CAOs, uh, Betsy Hinton and Willow County, uh, at that time, none of their councils had been taking up this issue. Um, they were broadly of the view that uh, it was unlikely that they would be, um, just given the time frames and the amount of uh, community capacity that they need to work with us in the pit. Um, that said, uh, we agreed that this may be a topic that at the political level councils would want to have a discussion with our community colleagues to decide if there was an interest, um, then that would be something that you know, councils could raise so that we could prepare for the next set of blood games that comes around. Uh, the other blood games aren't the only ones uh, that are hosted. There are some games, there are also the Dignified Plus games and other brothers that uh, these opportunities go forward. And the CAOs for the community felt that at the political level council wanted to talk about that. Um, we would love to receive that direction that their communication was that there was not an current initiative or within the administration's any uh, intent to do anything in this case. Mr. Given, any questions for Mr. Given on that? Thank you. Up at Mural Festival, in this case, I had uh, earlier declared a conflict of interest on this matter under. Section 10.2 of our Code of Conduct for Elected Officials bylaw. So I will excuse myself and let you know, me know, please, when yes. the discussion moves on to the next agenda, I will return. He's got his own off. Yeah. Thanks very much, uh, Deputy Mayor Keller. I mean, this is actually Mr. Reed, uh, his department, mm -hmm. uh, had a look at uh, options for this. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Go ahead. Uh, uh, hello again, uh, Deputy Mayor, Keller MP, and, and Council. Uh, so, indeed, uh, administration uh, took this item from Council's direction, and we, uh, I personally met, uh, well, spoke on the phone several times with the organizers of Uplift, and um, we are working together to promote some of the items that Council saw as positive or, or worth investigating further. Um, we are right now speaking with our insurance carrier to see whether or not there are any savings to be had if the Uplift Festival were to come under the municipal umbrella. Uh, so that's one option we are pursuing. Uh, we have found some quick wins, if you will, some walls that 
uh, we know we could offer to the Uplift Festival should they need them this year. Um, we are also working on some capability of partnering with Uplift and in essence, supporting or sponsoring, if you will, uh, the idea, pardon me, of that movable canvas uh, that council spoke of. Um, there are certainly some logistical items that we will pursue on our end, such as barricades and pylons and what support we can offer there. Um, also some of the, uh, I guess, collateral uh, impacts like where do all these rented lifts get stored every night? Uh, who or how will they get charged up for those that are electric? Um, and uh, basically that's the nutshell of where we've gotten to so far in our partnership. Um, other than uh, there's one other issue we spoke of being proactive about it, which would be having a staff uh, and certainly council as well, aware of the, the project itself or the festival and being able to speak to it as far as say alley closures um, and where that information might be able to be found. Uh, so that's basically the verbal report. If you have any questions, of course, I'm available. Any questions for council, Mr. Reed? Ms. Uh, Ms. Mayor Keller, I'm sorry, I was just to say, to close that off, so administration and, and Mr. Reed's team are uh, identifying opportunities to support the festival within the existing budget. I think the only additional direction we would need from council is if there was something specific that you wanted us to do that was outside of the approved budget or sort of in addition to the approved budget. Uh, if council is looking to make a material financial contribution of cash to the festival, uh, we would need a motion of direction to, to do so. Um, absent that motion, as Mr. Reed identified, we will find ways that we can fit uh, within our existing budget to support the festival. Um, and ideally, those would be ways that we have a net financial benefit to the to the organization, to the organization um, such as the you know thing under our insurance. If we do that, so essentially, we're looking to give them kind of opportunities this year. Uh, if the festival continues in future years, if they want to make a request to council for material financial support or cash grants, uh, administration has also provided them the process to, to ask for that. So. Um, I think from an administration perspective, uh, we'll work with them. Mr. Reed's team will work with them. Uh, we'll provide as far as we can. And we would consider the matter closed at the council level unless there was other specific direction. Council happy with that direction? Yeah, I'm very happy with that. And, uh, you know, uh, it's a small step forward, but I, I, uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing this. Blossom. Blossom and then other initiatives come forward because I think this is going to spark um, other community involvement initiatives. I think it's so exciting. I have a question for Mr. Gannon. If we did decide we wanted to give money this year, but is there somewhere it can come from? Is there, or is it because we're already approved budgets, just not an option? So the council wished to provide the direction to administration to uh, provide financial support to the festivals here. Um, I suggested we, the best way to do that would be to direct administration to identify an appropriate funding source for blank dollars as a grant possible. Um, so in terms of format of the motion, I think that, that would be the right way because we would have to go back to our budget so well, it's obviously early in the year and, and we can't say that we have both. Well, doesn't look like a spend all the money that we expect here. Um, we could look at reserves. Um, so that was an opportunity. Um, we look at programs that had started or went before. But council giving direction to us to go in about the amount of money we want to provide and basically tell us to go away and say, see if there's a lot of money that's appropriate for that and recommend it to us. I don't mean I don't think that Todd would allow us even with our next meeting to be cut pretty short in the next regular meeting where we can make a decision on that when it's kind of struck by that. I think given um supporting times, if they run into a problem, they could always come back at the end of the festival and uh, present to us if they needed help. 
you know, the option could be left open to them. We have done that in the past. Councilor Gamora? I'll defer to Councilor Hall first. Councilor Hall? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really happy with uh, what's in front of us. I just was curious because you did mention it. I just wanted to know what the process would have been, but I think what we're doing is, is great. I think that's going to be awesome. I agree. And do you need a motion? I think uh, maybe for this and the previous item, just a motion to see if we can put all of those for information. Mm -hmm. I just I did have one more question yeah. for administration. Through yeah. you, Jenna, uh, Deputy Mayor Keller, uh, Mr. Gibbon. <laughs> for the next step, if there is a request for future funding, would that have to come um, ahead or during budget deliberations that we've received in the past from other agencies? Uh, Council Moody, yes, that's that's correct. Um, administration and administration, I think Mr. Reed already had the discussion with you. Remember, they're saying, hey, this is so we'll do it again with you this year um, for future years. Um, you know, get your request in. Uh, I think overall, the approach would be to ask the new organizations to come forward early in the year, uh, prior to summer, ideally, uh, if their needs are known, um, so that we can incorporate those into what we present to Council. And there would still be an opportunity for something we want to present at the council budget discussion if there's some other additional um, that way can be incorporated before the close of the year and before council will be ready to use the budget. So can I have a councillor to make a motion to receive uh, the further uh, budget in this report? No information? Okay. Thank you, Councillor Watson. All in favor? And can I have a councillor to make a motion for the Epic Mural Festival uh, Municipal Support uh, Information? Councillor Gamora, all in favor? All right. Thank you. There are and welcome back to the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Correspondence, we have no correspondence today, uh, Mr. Gibbon. Motion action list, Mr. Gibbon. Thanks very much, Deputy Mayor Hall. So, we're uh, proposing a bunch of changes to the motion action list. Um, as you can see, uh, March has gone down, and a number of items that we're hoping to get for the council to go in March and just give a more close. Um, that uh, we're going to need to ask uh, for a number of those in April. And so you can see the revised target dates listed in the report. Um, and so those ones, I think, are, are highlighted. Additionally, uh, I would recommend that we could remove uh, the item with respect to municipal staff housing. And that was requested in September 14th. That was presented here today. And uh, the committee is sure to forward that on the council. Uh, the same with the 2018 to 2022 constitution plan that was presented today and received confirmation. Um, the sidewalk seating and retail area extension program, uh, that motion was, was a recommendation was delivered today. Council has chosen to forward that to a special meeting and so that, that has been delivered. There may be additional actions that arise from uh, Council's next review that issue that it, the, the direction that was given previously has been, been satisfied, I believe. Um, and the public mural festival and 2024 over the winter games items have also been so I suggest those uh, items go on the motion action list. So. Any questions from Mr. Gibbon on his request? Can I have a motion to receive um, the motion action list and the recommendations to move certain items? Councilor Hall, all in favor? All right. Council representation on various boards and meetings. Mayor Island. Just with respect to upcoming meetings, there is a you know, sort of partnership initiative meeting tomorrow that I will be attending. I have a Zoom call with the mayors of Banff and Canmore scheduled for Thursday afternoon. And it occurs to me that. Um, we agreed earlier today that I would call a special meeting for next Tuesday. I haven't yet done that. When I do that, um, the meeting 
is restricted to those specific items that are, are listed in the notice. And so I'm quite prepared to give it a couple of days before I, I actually give notice in the event that there is anything that administration might foresee as also requiring um, a decision of council since we will not otherwise sit as a council until the third Tuesday in April. So uh, I, just uh, as a note, I, I won't rush the calling of the special meeting and I'll give the administration a little bit of time to consider whether there is anything else that needs to be addressed um, by council because otherwise um, it would be a long time coming. Um, there are, and just on that, when I was away, I attended last Friday um, Evergreen's foundation meeting, and we made a decision on the budget for um, 2022, which is a $6.25 million increase to capitalization. Because I was away, I don't have all the paperwork, which I'm planning to go see the Evergreen uh, administrator this week. So at that meeting, I would like to present that report um, because on April 12th, unless I give you the report, Mayor Island, on April 12th, I will not be here because I have to go to Calgary for the Evergreen with Evergreens to the seniors conference. So I'll be gone from April 10th to 13th. I'll be in Calgary for those days. So I will not be able to chair um, that meeting. So get to my home. <laughs> So if I understand you correctly, then for the special meeting for next Tuesday, you would like to just have the opportunity yeah. to present. Yeah. We'll keep that as well as Thank you. Councilor Mayor. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Collier MP, regarding council representations on various boards. This Friday we'll have a um, Fence County Yellowhead quarterly board meeting that I'll be attending by Zoom, as well as Friday, the annual general meeting for the Jasper Yellowhead Historical Society, uh, which will also be uh, uh, in the evening, at, uh, and I'll be attending that by Zoom as well. Thank you, Councilor Mora. Councilor Tomoda. Tomorrow night, I will be um, mm -hmm. Well, actually, tomorrow is the uh, community conversations on um, environmental responsibility, as well as um, attending the course on municipal corporate planning and finance, um, Zoom meeting through the EOEP. And on um, Thursday is a Jasper Community Team Society uh, for the updated uh, process. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Calagrandi. I attended a library board meeting last Wednesday, um, and I will be off to the Friends of the Library Casino fundraiser at the end of April. And I too will be attending or registering for the EOE, EOEP. Oh, sorry, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, last Wednesday evening, I, I attend, or last Tuesday evening, sorry, I attended the uh, community conversation hosted by the RCMP. And uh, there were about, I think, about 10 uh, community residents with uh, uh, who expressed concern about the uh, speed in uh, uh, of traffic in the community and also concerns about victim services. Okay, Councillor Walter. Okay, upcoming events. Pride uh, Festival of Flag Raising, April 1 at 1215. Um, 13th Annual Just Pride Festival and Ski Festival, April 1 to 10. Strategic Planning Session on April 4 to 6 in Van. So there will be no council meeting on April 5th. Um, Just Park Chamber of Commerce General Meeting, Wednesday, April 20th, Shadow Jasper at 7.30 a.m. Metmal, Wednesday, April 20th, 5 to 7 at the Dead Dog. 
Emergency Preparedness Week, 2027. State of Municipality Address for the Just Park Chamber of Commerce, May 11. Intergovernment Committee, May 17, 9.30, hosted by Parks Canada. And we will have a special council meeting at 1.30 on March 29th here in this room. Anything else to add? Okay, it is 11.55. May I have a motion to move in camera? Um, Councilor, Councilor Hall? Um, all in favor? I would like to thank the members of the public for joining us. Mr. Given, when we come out of in camera, will there be any business that we need to bring back to the public? No, the premier teller actually won't be coming. So I'd like to thank all the members of the public that joined us today and all our members of staff. Thank you.